If you are watching this video, then we have piqued your curiosity in watching the most factual true crime series on YouTube. True Crime, Man's Dark Imagination. And now, here is your host, Alan Gotro. The cutting edge technical tool that could save freedom of speech and more importantly, save lives. The Defense Enabling Assistance Framework or DEAF protection has proven to be the state-of-the-art digital communications security technology and is so powerful and stealthy that governments have gone to great lengths to protect it. Visit us at DEFProtection.com. That's DEFProtection.com. When most of us learn the English language, we never really take the time to understand where certain phrases or words may have originated. This linguistic charm is very interesting and some of us discover that certain words or phrases actually have a totally different meaning than from what they were first intended. When one stops to think how the linguistical nature of some words or phrases came to be used in almost everyday vernacular, we hypothesize that they originated long ago by someone doing something or saying something in a point of history when it really mattered. This profile examines the origins of a phrase that was utilized quite often in Great Britain, and those of us from other parts of the world never imagined that such a colloquialism could have originated from such an horrendous crime. The tiny village of Alton, East Hampshire, had been known for its production of beer due to the large hops fields located near the town. The hamlet manufactured paper during the Middle Ages and also served as a picturesque market and was the site of a famous English Civil War battle in the 17th century. In 1863, the first brewery opened near the town due to the overabundance of hops, the main ingredient of beer, and demonstrated a great place to inhabit, start a business, and more importantly, start a family. Crime had never been a problem with the constabulary there. Of course, there were the occasional drunken disorderlies, but Alton was known for its small commercial contributions and the safety that families enjoyed throughout the centuries. On August 27, 1867, seven-year-old Fanny Adams and her closest friend, Minnie Warner, along with Fanny's seven-year-old sister, Lizzie, traveled down a country lane near the small village of Alton. While in the small clearing, the girls noticed a young man, well-dressed, but stumbling slightly as he appeared to have been drinking. The young man approached the girls and offered Minnie a halfpence so that she and Lizzie would go to the village and spend it the way they wanted. The young man offered the money to the young girls so that he could be alone with Fanny. Fanny accompanied the young man to the hollow, an area familiar to children near the village. As Minnie and Lizzie walked away, the young man picked Fanny up and walked toward a local hops field out of sight from the other children. This occurred at approximately 1 p.m. At approximately 5 p.m., Minnie and Lizzie, who had been playing since they met the young man, left for their journey home. A neighbor of the young girls, a Mrs. Gardner, saw the girls returning home, but she didn't see Fanny as she knew that Lizzie and Fanny always played together. Mrs. Gardner rushed to tell Mrs. Harriet Adams, Fanny and Lizzie's mother, that Fanny appeared missing. Just as Mrs. Gardner informed Mrs. Harriet Adams, they noticed a young man walking from the hop field. Mrs. Gardner approached the man and demanded to know what he had done with Fanny. The young man responded that he didn't do anything. He merely gave the girls money for candy. It's what he has always done with young children around the town. When queried again, the young man stated that Fanny left him in the hop field to rejoin his friends. Because he dressed rather respectfully, 
and carried himself in a dignified manner. Actually, he informed the women that he worked for a local solicitor, William Clement. The two ladies thought nothing of it and allowed him to go about his way. At approximately 7 p.m. that evening, Fanny had not returned and the adults of the village decided to organize a search party. The group walked with a purpose to the first place mentioned where Fanny was last seen. It did not take long for the members of the search party to locate her, but nothing prepared the party for the condition in which they did locate the young girl. As noted by one observer, it was a sickening scene of carnage. The child's severed head lay on two poles, deeply slashed from mouth to ear and across the left temple. Most horribly, both eyes were missing. Nearby lay a leg and a thigh. When the party spread out over the hop field, they located other parts of the murdered little girl. In one area, the searchers found the entire contents of Fanny's chest and pelvis, with the contents being scattered all over the place. Her internal organs were found a short distance away from this major discovery, slashed and mutilated. It took several days before the little girl's remains could be reassembled. Her eyes were later found in the river way. The obvious question that villagers asked was how could someone be so savage and callous as to not only murder a beautiful young child, but butcher and dismember her body in such a barbarous manner. Mrs. Adams collapsed as a result of learning the news about her daughter. She then had to inform George Adams, a bricklayer, about his daughter's fate. It appeared that he was playing cricket on the butts just south of the town. Mr. Adams collapsed as well from exhaustion and grief. When he regained his composure, George Adams, enraged and grief-stricken, returned to the family's home and retrieved his shotgun. Adams then went to the hop field to search for the murderer. Neighbors caught up with the distraught father and disarmed him, saying, let the law do their job. Police Superintendent William Cheney started an investigation into the case and then decided that the murderer may have been hiding in plain sight the whole time. He went to visit the obvious suspect, the young man that Mrs. Adams and Mrs. Gardner confronted coming from the hop field. Superintendent Cheney noted that the young man worked as a clerk for the local solicitor and found him there, working late. The young man, Frederick Baker, denied any knowledge of the disappearance and murder of little Fanny Adams. Superintendent Cheney arrested Baker and walked him out the door of the solicitor's office. When the lawman and his suspect walked out of the front door, a large crowd had gathered and surrounded the hunter and his quarry. Fortunately, Cheney escorted Baker to the Alton police station without incident. Superintendent Cheney noted that upon further examination of Baker's clothing, it appeared that droplets of blood were smeared onto the wristband of his shirt and his boots, socks, and trousers appeared wet. When police noted the condition of his clothing, Baker stated, That won't hang me, will it? Baker stated that he often stepped in water as he walked outside, but had no explanation as to the blood drops on his wristbands. The police found more evidence when they searched the suspect and discovered two small knives, one of them stained with blood. Superintendent Cheney then locked the suspect up in the jail and went to investigate Baker's whereabouts on the day of the murder. On the afternoon of the murder, Witnesses confirmed that Baker left the solicitor's office sometime around 1 p.m. on August 24th and returned to the office sometime around 3.25 p.m. Baker left the office again at 5.30 p.m. Mrs. Gardner and Mrs. Harriet Adams saw Baker coming from the direction of the hop field sometime around 5 p.m. Authorities theorized that Baker murdered little Fanny Adams upon first leaving the office and then the second sojourn he dismembered the body. One of the other clerks in the office where Baker worked, Maurice Biddle, stated that he saw the suspect at their place of employment at approximately 6 p.m., where Baker related to his co-worker the confrontation with Mrs. Gardner and Mrs. Adams, and Baker appeared unsettled. Biddle related that Baker stated, It will be very awkward for me if the child is murdered. Biddle also related that he and Baker went to a pub and had a pint or two and Baker told Biddle he may have to leave town the following Monday. Biddle informed Baker that if he did that, he may have problems finding a job. Baker then stated, I could go as a butcher. On the following Monday after Baker's detention, Biddle went searching through Baker's work desk and found a journal that contained an entry 
that Baker admitted to writing after his arrest. The entry stated, 24th August, Saturday, killed a young girl. It was fine and hot. Baker would later aver that he wrote the entry when he was drunk and that it only meant that he was aware a young girl had been murdered. A young boy came forward to give a statement regarding the day of Fanny's murder. The young man stated that he witnessed Baker emerging from the hop garden at 2 p.m. His hands were bloody, as was his clothing. While Baker sat in jail, a local painter, William Walker, had found a large stone on the hop field with blood, long hair, and a small piece of flesh stuck to it. This discovery caused the local division surgeon, Dr. Lewis Leslie, to declare that the stone was most probably the murder weapon. At the inquest conducted before the deputy county coroner, Robert Harfield, at the Duke's Inn, a local jury had been assembled. Considering the evidence thus far, including Minnie Warner, who described what occurred that day, they believed that Baker murdered and then dismembered Fanny Adams and returned a verdict of willful murder for killing and slaying Fanny Adams. Authorities then remanded the defendant to the Winchester prison for a formal committal hearing, committing the defendant to trial. On August 29, 1867, a committal hearing was held at the Alton Town Hall before the local magistrates. Frederick Baker, still protesting his innocence, was remanded back to the prison where he would be held for trial at the next county assizes. Baker implored the authorities for more protection as he feared a large mob would kidnap him from the local jail and lynch him. The trial opened on December 5, 1867, with the courtroom waiting for the little Minnie Warner, who had to be carried into the courtroom to testify. Immediately upon the child identifying Baker as the man that offered the girls money and carried Fanny into the hop field, the defense strenuously objected and concentrated on Baker's mental health, which, subsequently, the court and the public discovered a long history of hereditary insanity. The defense brought to the surface how Baker's father had a propensity to murder his own children, although no evidence came to the forefront proving this assertion. A cousin who had been in and out of asylums for most of his life, and Baker attempting suicide after a failed love affair. At the conclusion of the succinct trial, after all evidence and testimony had been presented to the jury, the judge gave his charges and then released them for deliberation. Fifteen minutes after the judge issued his charges, the jury announced they had a verdict. The jury stated that they found the defendant guilty of the crime charged and fixed the penalty at death by hanging. On Christmas morning, December 25, 1867, in front of a crowd that numbered more than 5,000, considerably more than the population of Alton, Hampshire, Frederick Baker climbed the gallows and within 10 minutes, the court sentence had been carried out. After his execution, the public discovered that Baker had written a letter to Fanny's parents where he expressed, in an unguarded hour and not with malice aforethought, he murdered Fanny Adams. Baker assured the parents that her death was without any pain or struggle. Baker steadfastly denied any other violations of the child with the dismemberment as an exception. Fanny's headstone had been erected soon after her death, but it was only renovated a few decades ago and still stands where it was originally erected. Here, in this photograph, we see the headstone flanked by Minnie Weaver and Fanny's little sister, Lizzie Adams, the two girls who accompanied her the day of Fanny's death and identified Frederick Baker as the culprit. Historians have noted that the investigators became stumped when they viewed the knives confiscated from Baker's wardrobe. They could not believe that the weapons found could have caused all the injuries to Fanny Adams' body as they eventually viewed her remains. Some say that at the time of the Fanny Adams case, there was a delicate balance because of the horrific way the young girl was dispatched and the ever popular and cheery English brand of humor, which played a part so that the case would never be forgotten. In 1867, when the Royal Navy issued rations in the form of canned beef, 
Some sailors remarked, who expressed disappointment at the contents of the cans, and called the vacuum mess Fanny Adams. This phrase for sweet nothing made its way into the vernacular of the armed services. As most phrases in the English language may gain some notoriety and change in meaning, the phrase Fanny Adams is the full pronunciation of the letters F-A. In vernacular of the present day, it means f it all. It also means that someone knows very little about a particular subject. Until next time. Hello everyone, this is Alan Goto, your host of True Crime Man's Dark Imagination. If you would like to support our channel, you can become a member of Subscribestar. There are different levels and subscribers get special privileges. Also, we do have a PayPal account. If you enjoy our work here, please think about subscribing. I will leave the links below in the comment section. We thank you very much for your viewing and please stay tuned for future programs. Hehehehe. <laughs>